Welcome everyone to the LSE for this International Growth Center online event, which is a part of this year's LSE Festival, Shaping the Post-COVID World, uh, a week of virtual events free and open to all, taking place this week until Saturday the 6th of March, about the direction the world could and should be taking after the COVID crisis and how social science research can be shaping it. My name is Naila Kabir, and I'm Professor of Gender and International Development at the London School of Economics and Political Science. This year, the festival is adapting to the new normal, with all the events being held online and streamed via Zoom and the Festival Hub, the online home of the LSE Festival. So make sure you visit the Festival Hub to access all festival content, including our series of live events via Zoom and a series of pre-recorded 10-minute talks with LSE faculty uh, festival shorts. The full program can be found at lse.ac.uk uh, stroke festival. For those who are Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE, all capital, capital F festival. This online event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available uh, as a podcast subject, of course, to no technical difficulties. We're going to have a designated time at the end of the panel discussion to answer questions. So please do type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. And please do make sure also to include your full name and organizational affiliation. Women make up almost two, two fifths of the global workforce of the world, but they have suffered more than half of the to total job losses during this crisis. That has left them 1.8 times more vulnerable to the pandemic's impact than men. The female labor force participation in India is only 25%. Among India's working women, 90% are engaged in informal employment, unpaid or irregular work in the formal and informal sectors. According to the ILO in 2018, women in India spent 312 minutes a day in urban areas and 291 minutes a day in rural areas on unpaid care work. Corresponding to that, men spent only 29 minutes a day in urban areas and 32 minutes a day in rural areas on unpaid care work. So we started out with considerable asymmetry. In addition, food insecurity is on the rise and public health care systems have been severely disrupted. For the country's 600 million women, the impacts could be long lasting. Without corrective measures to protect female workers, women's food security and reproductive health, the pandemic will further entrench existing economic inequalities. Ahead of International Women's Day on the 8th of March, 2021, we will be exploring how India can adopt a more gender inclusive policy planning and implementation to manage the impact of COVID-19. I will be putting a question or two to each of our speakers before we move on to a general discussion and offer you a chance to ask your own questions. So let me welcome the, our expert panelists uh, who are here to tackle this challenging topic. We have Farzana Afridi, Associate Professor of Economics at the Indian Statistical Institute in Delhi. Uh, she is also the lead academic for the International Growth Center in, in India. And we have Diva Dhar, who is the senior program officer with the gender equality team at the, Bill and, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So let me start with Farzana. Farzana, towards the end of 2020, the IMF has warned that the incidence of in extreme poverty will rise for the first time in over two decades. And inequality is set to increase because the, this, the crisis has disproportionately affected women the informally employed, and those with relatively lower educational attainment. So my question to you is, what has been the impact of COVID-19 on women in India, and which areas of women's lives have been affected the most? Thank you so much, Naila, for the question, and thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to a stimulating discussion today with Naila and with Diva and everybody here who's uh, joined us. 
Um, I'm going to answer the question that Naila has put to me uh, by referring to two sets of studies uh, that I'm doing currently. One, which is a panel study, which is following about 3,000 uh, husbands and wives, matched husband-wife data in urban India, in Delhi in particular. And another study which I have, uh, in which I have looked at what has been the impact uh, across the nation in terms of employment uh, and, you know, relatively comparing rural urban areas as well as the gender impact. And while social protection may have benefited uh, one section of society much more than the other. So to begin with and answer the question that Anila has asked, I want, uh, I think, to focus here on one aspect of the pandemic, which we haven't looked at carefully, which is the emotional and the psychosocial well-being. And I think that's very, very critical here. And there's unfortunately very little work for developing countries in particular. There is a ton of research for UK, for the US in terms of the psychological impact. So in this particular study where we've been following the men and women pre-crisis. So we have uh, data from them uh, in 2019. And then we happened to be conducting interviews just at the time when the lockdown happened in India in March, started in March and April, May is when we conducted the first round of studies. And it seems that, you know, uh, women appear to be suffering from much greater mental stress than men are. So for example, both men and women are worrying more about financial adequacy than about their health, which is what you would think that they would worry about. So to give you an example, almost 82% of women felt anxious or nervous just around the time of the lockdown as compared to 64% of men. So that's a substantive difference in terms of proportion of women who are feeling stressed. And it seems to be driven by the financial stress. And the biggest contributor to women's stress appears to be anxiety, nervousness, followed by depression, health worries, and sleep disorders. And that has implications for the productivity of women. So when we wanted to move that and to think about what are the economic implications, I think we need to be very cognizant of the fact that there are severe mental uh, pressures which might be bigger for women as opposed to men. And then we go on to the domain of looking at what the economic impact, the direct and the indirect economic impact on women has been. So what the data tells us is that on average, if you look across the country, then men's uh, job losses have been impacted or has occurred much on a much larger scale than it has for women. But when you condition this on whether a woman was working before the pandemic, then the impact conditional on employment has been much larger for women than it has been for men. And these effects are also going to vary by the nature of occupation that they've been engaged in. So for example, rural women who typically tend to be self-employed in agriculture, or they may be able to take up public employment such as Narega, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, they, it seems, have been buffeted more because self-employment means that you're not going to lose the jobs which typically women, rural, poor, uh, rather urban poor women might be engaged in, which is, as Naila pointed out, would be in the informal sector. So, for example, very often the, the women, the poor women in urban areas are engaged as domestic help in providing services. And uh, those are non-contractual jobs, jobs without any benefits. Those are what we would call mm -hmm. not the good jobs that women are getting because they don't come with any benefits. And so they have been impacted more by the shock. So initially, it seems that some of these casual work, if we call it casual mm -hmm. contractual work, was impacted a lot more early on in the pandemic immediately when the shutdown happened, but it is also recovered much faster. So uh, men whose casual work was impacted much more. So for them, the recovery has been pretty quick and very steep. Whereas for women, the recovery has been much slower because mm -hmm. people also, you know, social distancing and concerns and so on have continued and uh, uh, households do not want uh, non-permanent help coming in, for example, you know, one kind of a job that women would be engaged in much more in the urban areas. So I think one thing that we need to be aware of is that there are going to be short-term impacts and long-term impacts. We're looking at a dynamic situation here. And as Naila pointed out, the long-term implications for women much be, uh, might be much deeper 
and greater than they would be for men, particularly when we think of intergenerational impacts, when we look at education and other ways in which these financial shocks can impact the younger girls and adolescent girls as well. Okay, thanks very much. Um, very quickly, what was the class composition of the service? The anxiety story, did it vary by class at all? So the uh, survey that we are doing uh, is amongst uh, urban poor women. Okay, thank uh, you. We're not thank looking you. across the spectrum. Okay. We're looking at women who are in the lower middle class bracket, okay. not in the middle income. So let me now turn to Deva. Uh, Deva, food and nutrition insecurities worsen during economic crisis. Cultural traditions in India dictate that women are the first to experience hunger when resources are in short supply. Even in normal times, we know that Indian women consume nutrient-rich foods less frequently than men. Short-term malnutrition can lead to permanent exclusion from the labor market and from government welfare schemes, contributing to a new cycle of poverty amongst working-class women. What policy measures, uh, what policy responses and measures are needed to reduce gender inequalities in, um, in food security and nutrition? And how can we ensure that marginalized women participate and benefit from social protection interventions? Thanks, Naila. I think we know from the work of a number of researchers in India that COVID has worsened food insecurity and exacerbated gender gaps. As you said, women are the first uh, to go hungry when there is food, food scarcity, for example. They are less likely to have access to nutrient-rich foods, also less likely to have access to diverse foods, and even pre-COVID were more likely to be malnourished. So COVID has only triggered different pathways to affect their gains uh, to nutrition, both in terms of how the economy has affected losses to income and purchasing power, so the kinds of effects that Farzana talked about, but also how the lockdowns associated with COVID have affected the delivery of health and nutrition services, so from the supply side, and limited access to <clears throat> services like school meals, for example, or take-home rations uh, from government programs. The government has stepped up schemes. They've you know, done different kinds of programs. So increased rations of subsidized food grains through the public distribution system, increased uh, take-home ration, facilitated the pickup of midday meal schemes. But a lot of these cash transfers as well, uh, which I think Farzana mentioned. So cash transfers have been dispersed to women's bank accounts, uh, for example, um, and public workfare programs like the job guarantee scheme have also been ramped up. But there is potential to make these programs more gender intentional, given that COVID has affected women uh, a lot worse for both in terms of economic effects, but also, as you mentioned, for their nutritional uh, effects. For example, um, the court has mandated that midday meals, school meals, be delivered at home. A number of states are doing this a number of others are not. The burden of picking up rations, of picking up, uh, accessing these meals often falls on the women. So it only increases what we know is a care crisis in India. Secondly, a number of these cash transfers um, have gone to women's accounts, but surveys show, for example, only a fourth of households in Delhi have actually received uh, the biggest of these programs. Even the farmer schemes um, again, you know, access has not been universal. So there need to be efforts to step up enrollment, uh, registration efforts, especially for marginalized women and households, as you said. Surveys have shown that it's a mix of households receiving it. So often it's wealthier households who are accessing these benefits. They're not always targeted to the poorest, basically because they're using prior registries and we don't have social registries that are detailed or updated on a regular basis and targeting becomes difficult uh, in times of crises. And lastly, public workfare programs have largely been focused in rural areas. So they haven't actually addressed the needs of urban poor women, which as Farzana mentioned, have been affected 
uh, in the crisis have not recovered jobs and work as fast, but there are really no urban safety nets or job guarantee programs. The rural guarantee scheme as well has, um, there isn't data, but a lot of discussion around as male migrants come home, you know, they're exhausting and getting the household quota. So there needs to be more gender intentional uh, responses to creating job opportunities for women, even in rural areas. There are examples, for example, where um, the provision of care has been done through this program. It's been done in South Africa. It's been done in the state of Telangana. These are all areas where you can create job opportunities for women using job guarantee schemes that also address constraints like care, like childcare or unpaid care work. So there may be potential there to make programs more gender inclusive. Thank you. Well, on this issue of care, uh, we know that a recent study by the economist Ashwini Deshpande found that Indian men initially stepped up to share household chores when the spring lockdowns were imposed, but by August, uh, men's time spent on housework, housework while still higher than the pre-pandemic levels, had declined. And more educated men spend less time on domestic work than their less educated counterparts. So either of you, or both of you, are, how can we ensure real change within COVID-19 recovery and response by ad addressing, and this is a tough one, uh, the invisible entrenched norms within families and institutional settings? So either of you, challenging question. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to go first. I'm sure Diva will have a lot more to say mm -hmm. after I've uh, given my two uh, cents worth. Um, I think, so this is, I think, a really interesting and uh, not just interesting, but a fundamental question. And uh, I'm happy to at least uh, report that, you know, one of the things that we started doing with in this panel that we started before the crisis was essentially to study what these gender norms and attitudes are towards women's work, both uh, particularly outside the home. And uh, also how this, uh, what the norms around the networks that men have and the networks that women have influence women's decisions to work uh, and be engaged remuneratively. And, uh, and luckily for us, the, since we have this panel, we are going to continue, we're going, continuing to ask this question as we go along uh, during the initial lockdown and as uh, the lockdown has eased uh, to find out whether there are any changes in these norms and attitudes towards uh, women and the gender division of work within the household and outside. I think theoretically what we know for sure is that a, a, there's a ton of studies there which for instance tell us that women's participation in the labor market tends to be anti-cyclical, right? So we know that when there are these shocks, then women would tend to go out more because they have to bear a greater burden of mm -hmm. the, uh, the financial, uh, the loss of livelihoods that the men are suffering. And this has uh, been documented through, uh, you know, in Latin America, for instance, during the uh, crises, the, uh, the economic crisis that they had. Um, we know, for instance, that in India, the rural participation of women in the labor market is much higher than it is in urban areas. And that we are seeing this decline, at least in the NSS, uh, suggesting that the decline that we're observing in women's labor force participation has been happening in rural areas areas as opposed to the urban areas where it is lower in levels and has been sticky, right? So uh, I think uh, it is possible that it, during the COVID times, it becomes more acceptable for women to work uh, because they have to, uh, because men are losing earnings and the substantive losses. So for example, from our estimates, immediately following the lockdown, there was a 90% decline in monthly earnings. And that's huge. So that was 90% for men. Again, these poor, you know, men, most of whom are engaged in uh, informal work. It's not salaried work, whereas uh, uh, for women, it was about 30%, but that's conditional on whether you're working or not, right? So uh, so, uh, so, it's possible that we're going to see an increase in self-employment. So our data, for instance, suggests what Diva was talking about, Narega, for instance, we're looking at uh, using the CMI data set, 
which tells you the employment levels uh, across the country and combining it with the Narega data that we've seen pre-crisis and post-crisis and starting from April of 2020 going on till August of 2020, what we see is that there is a 70% uh, higher uh, take up of Narega by women as opposed to about 6% buffering of the losses of uh, work by men. And the reason we find that women might be taking up these jobs more is precisely because these works are being provided closer to home, which allows you to balance care work as well as uh, work outside. And also because of the lower wages that are being provided, it is unskilled labor. So even though men might be coming back, migrating back, they're also relatively the most skilled labor, which, which were, have left from but the- For Zana, for Zana. I think yeah. there's a, a tougher question in there somewhere. And that is not so much women taking up waged work of various kinds to reconcile it with care work. But is it possible for men to be as flexible and to start right. to take on more unpaid care work? So yes, it's we've that's often that's seen the yeah. one way direction, but the flexibility seems to be asymmetrical. Let me see if Viva has an answer. Sure. Um, just to give you some context, pre-COVID, so if you look at uh, data from the World Value Survey for India, looking at gender attitudes uh, and norms, we know that India is one of the few countries that actually regressed uh, in terms of norms between 2004 and 2014, so prior to this government. And the next World Value Survey data is going to be released later this year, so post-COVID, and it's going to be interesting to see how gender norms have shifted and in which direction. As you said, men did step up and do more work that has reduced since uh, you know, the economy opening up and lockdowns shifting. So while there is a one-time shock um, that may have longer term effects in terms of men's engagement in unpaid care work, I think it's going to be useful to see how much it's actually changed Mm -hmm. uh, attitudes to equality and sharing just because uh, disproportionately women are, of course, carrying mm -hmm. the burden. The three yeah. prongs usually for unpaid care work are recognize, reduce, redistribute. You've talked about the data. So from the time you survey that was held, which is a part about recognizing uh, this work. Um, there is also, of course, programs that different governments are considering. So social norm change campaigns, education and media interventions, different state governments, for example, Punjab and Odisha are taking up uh, evidence-informed uh, interventions, partnering with NGOs like Breakthrough to embed gender equality curriculum in their school programming. Mm -hmm. So to highlight and scale up these interventions. And I think more such programs need to be adopted even as education budgets are, are being reduced to actually think about how norm change can happen within the education system, but also within broader programs that the government has launched, which include Save the Girl Child, Educate the Girl Child. Um, so, okay. No, I, 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 we all acknowledge that this is a very difficult one and every country is struggling with, uh, you know, but this is one of the most deeply entrenched of norms. But I know that OECD data says that India has a particular problem. Uh, the inequality in uh, responsibility for unpaid care work, that inequality is largest amongst the countries covered in India and followed by Pakistan. So I think some of the, and starting with education, I think is, is a very good idea. Let me come back to Farzana. Um, Farzana, what role can women's leadership play in addressing gender equality in the post COVID-19 response policies and programs? Is there something we can do to ensure women's participation and leadership within this response? Is there something that you can do in, in the Indian context? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll address that question. I think one thing that we want to talk about just going back to norms here was, uh, I think one of the fundamental things that need to be changed in order to change norms is also to improve the returns that women get from, mm -hmm. the, from work from a remunerative work. And I think that's a simple, from an economist perspective, when you improve those returns, you are going to see men sharing more of the burden of 
uh, child care or any other kind of care work which is unpaid at home and we've seen that in developed countries right mm -hmm. i mean we've seen mm -hmm. from all the work that has been documented in the us for example when the returns to women's work increased dramatically there was more mm -hmm. investment in their education there was a greater participation of women in the workforce and men if you look at the time news data for example coming out from the oecd countries then more educated parents we see are actually spending more time with their children because they are investing more in the quality of their children they care mm -hmm. more about the quality of the children and we are going to see the same thing happening if we are going to focus on providing good jobs right we don't want to just give any kinds mm -hmm. of job we don't want to just kind of throw any job at a woman mm -hmm. but good jobs which require legislation which require equity in terms of wages equity in terms of benefits and not just legislation but also implementation and monitoring of that and i think that holds across both the private sector uh you know uh definitely and the informal work so for example we see women slaving away for pittance mm -hmm. you know for hours of work that they have to do which is coming out of factories uh because they're destitute women and they're taking up this work mm -hmm. so how do we bring that dignity of work mm -hmm. to a woman even if they're working from home which is remunerative and ensure that they have basic rights which are being met i think that's fundamental going back to the question that naila you asked about leadership we know that in our country there's 50% reservation for instance for in local governments mm -hmm. which is at the village level and uh, there have been repeated attempts to ensure reservation for women at higher levels of government both within the panchayat system and in the state legislatures and in the national government uh because there is a lot of work which documents the role of influ uh, of uh, of role models and that's number one number two also that the uh, preferences of the women leaders are more likely to align with the preferences of the women electorate in terms of provision of basic services related to health and education that women care about a lot more Mm -hmm. and also to act as role models in terms of getting them out of the home and getting them engaged in both society as well as mm -hmm. the economy so i think that is something that we've been trying to do for many years but we've not been successful because there's been a push back from men yeah. and we need to kind of see how we can engage with men in this uh in 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 pushing this legislation through because i think it can have a dramatic impact on uh the uh, on on young women uh seeing um, you know women in leadership roles and being mm -hmm. active yeah uh i think that's one thing that i would suggest from a policy perspective that seems to be um they were staying with that question can you think of any examples of women in any form of leadership it doesn't have to be at the national level um kind of making a difference to what's happening around the covid responses Plenty. I think women have really been at the forefront of the COVID response in India. Whether it's our frontline workers, so delivering health and yeah. nutrition services and tackling uh, the challenges uh, on the field, or women's economic collectives, so self-help groups, um, who are you know been you know sort of stepped up to this crisis in many different ways. Whether it was in terms of spreading awareness, helping people access benefits, uh, providing. uh you know responding to needs for around masks or sanitizers so really stepping up production for these services or meals preparing the meals that we discussed so i think women's groups and frontline workers have really shown their capability to respond to these crises and these need to be areas that are built and promoted further uh by the government so the national rural livelihoods mission already you know has around 70 million women yeah. in these grassroots collectives these are programs that should be built out similarly frontline workers of course are predominantly women mm -hmm. but what is the sort of representation at different levels of public health system within the government but also in other organizations responding to it global health 5050 is releasing their report tomorrow and while that of course is going to be more focused or is it today actually maybe it's today <laughs> losing track of time 
but you know, showing how it's actual representation for women mm -hmm. in these uh, different levels of uh, organizations can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we'll open up to the audience now uh, and take some questions from them. And there seem to be a few. So we'll take questions in groups of three and either of you can uh, decide if you want to respond. Um, so one, my goodness, these are difficult questions. One is how would you, how would you, how would allowing, how would you allow female feticide change Indian society? How would you change that through more intercaste marriage, interreligious marriage, more acceptance of male homosexuality, greater gender equality? That's one question, uh, not an easy one. Then we have what theories and frameworks would you suggest are efficient tools to assess the gender sensitivity of social protection measures? Uh, and then uh, a, a question to all of you, uh, what do you think would be one change of policy that would have the largest impact? I think Diva can take the first question. <laughs> nice one, Prasanna. Well, take right, anyone you want. Diva, do you want to take the first one? Yeah, yeah, happy to. Go happy ahead. To um, I think I just want to say that, you know, existing programs uh, that outlaw uh, sex selective abortion uh, or penalties uh, or monitoring systems may not always be the most effective. Other programs that we discussed, so things like gender norm change, educational media interventions, may be ways uh, that government programs like Beti Bajao, which is Save the Girl Child, Educate the Girl Child, are looking into in terms of actually addressing this issue of fostering and promoting gender equality. So there, you know, I think we have to think through what the different policy options are in terms of what is going to be most effective uh, to addressing the child sex ratio issue. Okay, uh, Fazana, you wanna take one of the other ones? Yeah, I think there was a question on social protection. Yes, how, what sort of frameworks could help? Right. To I think uh, in India, the there have been, uh, in, in terms of policy, there have been a ton of initiatives which have focused particularly on women, as Diva also mentioned in her first response. So, for example, the cash transfers that have been made to Jandhan accounts for the first uh, three months or the first six months, I can't remember. Uh, then there were these um, LPG cylinders, which were given free uh, for the for three what months. What is LPG cylinders? Uh, so that's for cooking, cooking fuel, liquefied mm -hmm. petroleum gas. That's a bottle gas for cooking, which can be a significant cost uh, for uh, particularly for rural households. So they could get that free. So, for example, the Ujwala program that the government has been running is running, uh, it's directly aimed at women. So it's money which gets deposited into the linked bank accounts of women. Uh, then um, I think in terms of uh, uh, the Narega program, for instance, the way it is structured, uh, the design of the program, and in terms of uh, the accessibility of jobs and the quality of pay, uh, that is also, it seems to, at least from my analysis, have benefited uh, it has benefited women uh, more than it has benefited uh, men. Uh, and I think these are great initiatives. Uh, I think one thing that uh, I would like to build on in terms of the point that Diva made about frontline workers, uh, the ASHA workers, for example, which is the accredited uh, social health activists who have been at the front line in terms of uh, uh, you know, in, uh, imposing some of these social distancing measures, and also now probably uh, they would be in terms of uh, the vaccination drive, uh, have unfortunately not been uh, uh, paid or, you know, uh, been acknowledged in terms of the remuneration they've been getting before COVID, but also more so during the COVID uh, crisis because they have put an extra amount of work and in, uh, effort during this whole period. And I think we need to acknowledge these frontline workers. 
Um, uh, so I think there have been pl plenty of initiatives which have been great and we need to sustain them over time, even beyond the crisis uh, mm -hmm. in terms of hosting, you know, women's uh, mm -hmm. uh, participation. There is one specific question for you, for your presentation, Farzana, and that is, is your ongoing study at multi-centric level or just confined to urban-based women in Delhi? But you talked about a couple of studies, didn't you? Yeah, so the first one that I was talking about is based in urban areas of Delhi. So these are the poorer areas which are close to the factory uh, establishments uh, in, in Delhi. And so it's both men as well as women. So we're going to these households mm -hmm. and we're asking questions of uh, the husbands as well as the wives. Uh, mm -hmm. The next study that I talked about was using secondary data. So we use the Narega data set, which is available on the uh, Narega public portal. And we've mashed it at the district level with the Center for Monitoring of the Indian Economy data, which tells you about general employment. So we can sort of figure out what has Narega done to general employment levels of men and women. Okay, I haven't been reading the names of the people asking questions, so let me start doing that. This is from P.J. Srao. Does the term gender equality contain an implicit assumption that women aren't equal to men? Well, I can say it does. Isn't gender equality a threat to women who see themselves as superior to men and or in charge of the household? In his ancestral home, uh, there are more girls born than boys and women make decisions. Okay, that's one question. From I3 Roy Chowdhury, women's uh, participation in the labor market in India has been declining steadily in the pre-COVID era. The pandemic has facilitated the process of working from home and has enabled multitasking and work from home as well as taking care of the family at the same time. I don't know what the question is there. It seems like a statement. And then from Zoe Wright, as government is coming up with ways to help the economy recover post COVID, are there particular themes, areas, industries that you think should be prioritized for the greatest benefit for gender equality efforts? Uh, are there any particular regulatory bar barriers for entre new entrepreneurs, for example, that disproportionately affect women that should be prioritized? So the first one is, is, is someone who uh, has comes from a village where there are more girls born than boys and then women make the decisions. So he doesn't think that uh, gender equality um, is an appropriate concept. The second is the fact that, you know, COVID has allowed women to work from home. And what does this mean for the decline in female labor force participation? I think that's what it means. And then the third one is what areas should be prioritized um, for the greatest benefit? to gender equality efforts. Either of you? Um, I, 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 can, I can do some quick fire and then the, Diva can- Go ahead, <laughs> and then Diva will do some quick fire. I, I would say that if you're looking at a matriarchal society, then for sure, yes, women might want to stay on in control. But I think we are talking about the predominant patriarchal societies where women are relegated to within the walls of the house and not allowed to, uh, you know, uh, have say in other matters. So uh, so that's my answer to that question. The second is work from home. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's something that we need to take into account the fact that it, it, it is probably going to become uh, more acceptable and easier for women to work from home, uh, particularly educated women, because it's not the rural women and it is not women who don't have at least graduate level of education who can provide those kinds of services from home. But I think we also, again, need to be aware of the fact that we are imposing a greater burden on women then. You still expect them to provide all the care services and or do all the domestic work and do and be you know, employed remuneratively. Um, I think that we need to think about that a little bit harder. So coming to policy priorities then, I think the number one policy priority in the background of this question would be provision of childcare services 
uh, provision of, uh, which we don't have in India, for example, public provision of childcare services is completely non-existent. There have been some uh, programs which have been trying to provide that, uh, but have not taken off and have not been successful because there might be concerns about quality, but also there are issues around norms, again, that it is the primary uh, you know, duty of a woman to provide childcare. And so how can you use market services, for instance, to substitute that? So those are other reasons why the take up might be poor. So we need to work both on the demand side for these care services, as well as constraints on the supply side to enable women to, you know, uh, be engaged within the home, but reduce the amount of burden that they have in the home, but also take advantage of the opportunities that they may have now of working uh, remuneratively from within the home. Mm -hmm. Diva, any? Yeah, I think I just <laughs> Yeah, on the gender equality question, gender equality is really looking about how men and women are differentially affected. So it's not only about women, uh, for example, if you think about COVID, men actually have um, this, you know, stuff suffered disproportionately from uh, incidents, at least based on reported cases that you see. But conditional on um, being reported as a COVID case, women are more likely to die uh, in India. So, you know, I think it is useful to understand what are some of the dynamics that are driving uh, differences for for men and women, even if you just look at COVID incidents uh, and deaths. One, of course, you need the data and the data is not always regularly reported or available for many countries. Only one in three countries report um, COVID incidents. India, if, you know, there's every state sort of has its own system. And so there are a few states that report this data, others that don't. Um, so, you know, we also have a very patchy picture of what's happening. And then trying to understand what is driving those gender differences for COVID, since that is the, the, the theme, right? So some research from Renee Adams, for example, has shown that female labor force participation is a reason. So women work less, they're more likely to be out. That's one of the reasons why men are disproportionately affected. So I think these things are complex areas of around women's work can lead to other places where women, where men, for example, face other consequences. So I think we need to take these, you know, both uh, in, into account when we're discussing gender equality. On the issue of work from home, um, I think one thing to recognize is that a very small part of Indian women are actually in the formal work sector and can benefit from workplace policies like work from home. But it's going to be extremely important for, for that sort of set of women to have that kind of flexibility we know from previous um, research that when workplace flexibility is offered, women's retention improves, women's productivity increases. So having workplace policies that can make women balance care responsibilities along with work is needed. While, as Farzana was saying, stressing, uh, emphasizing the need to actually address that care problem uh, more comprehensively. Using existing government programs, India already has a child development scheme uh, with the possibility of expanding access to, to daycare from that. There's a national crash service scheme, uh, which could bring in, for example, partnerships with uh, existing civil society organizations that are providing care. So I think there is um, a lot of potential to do more in this area post COVID, um, to really think about creating opportunities for women who can be employed in the sector while sort of uh, addressing the constraint that's holding women back. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, the COVID crisis has brought the whole care economy, whether it's paid care, which is more visible, or unpaid care, to the forefront of our attention. But I think what we're still finding is a lot of the responses have been on, uh, on the paid sector, on essential workers in the paid sector. And we're still looking for more support for those women who are having to juggle all these different demands of their time at home. Um, uh, a question again from uh, I3, I3 Roy Chowdhury. Could you elaborate, and I think this is for you, Farzana, on the mental health crisis in India, which has been precipitated by the pandemic, and share your feedback, and this is for both of you, 
on the increase in domestic violence. So, uh, you want to go first, Farzana? Sure. Um, so, I think there is this dimension of the psychological effects in terms of the social distancing, which has had uh, a huge impact, which has not been documented. Um, and, and in some cases, you know, fatal impacts because we've seen, uh, at least anecdotally, we seem, it seems to suggest that there's an increase in suicides, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 in, in India, for example, you know, we've, I, 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 one doesn't know whether it is reporting mm -hmm. or it is actual increase in incidence. Um, but yes, strict lockdowns are likely to have an impact on one's uh, mental well-being. And so the questions that we had asked uh, were, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've, been, we've been continuing to ask these questions over uh, multiple survey rounds. So immediately when the lockdown happened, and again, this is a very specific sample. It is not across all income strata. We are looking at those households which are the most likely to have been affected or financially stressed. So we, as I pointed out, 90% decline in earnings is, is massive. It's like your earnings are completely wiped out. And uh, we asked them simple questions about, you know, what is the intensity of the feelings you have related to uh, stress, anxiety, nervousness, and it seems to be pretty high because 70 to 90%, uh, particularly more so for women, seem to be reporting uh, uh, at least uh, severe to very severe uh, uh, feelings of uh, these sorts. And it doesn't, it doesn't seem so in a subsequent round that we looked at, which has been starting from August going on to November when we've had uh, the social distancing measures being removed, there's no significant decline in the observed levels that we have seen, particularly also the gender differences seem to persist. And it points to the fact that when we look at the recovery in terms of employment and earnings, there has been an increase or a jump back. So you would call it a V-shape, but it is not a recovery which is taking you all the way back to the pre-pandemic level. So there is still a long distance to go before earnings can go back to what they were before the crisis. So that means that the psychological impact is likely to persist over longer periods as the economy takes time to recover. And also as the pressures on women in terms of you know, uh, taking care of some of the, uh, sharing this burden of the financial stress uh, continues for longer periods. Um, I think that was- okay. That's fine. Um, Viva, on, on the domestic violence question, have you got any, um, further information or, you know, responses? I mean, I, you know, we know from previous research that domestic violence reporting increased during the lockdown. So there was a sharp increase uh, in what was reported. There's also been, uh, you know, the government has stepped up by classifying response services as being essential. So uh, having more helplines, having more one-stop crisis centers, uh, having um, others respond to this issue. Having said that, I think there needs to be a lot um, better understanding of- Has um, there been take up of these right. new measures, of these additional measures? There has been take up because we know reporting increased, right? So okay. reporting itself yeah. is, a, is a proxy for more people using and yeah. responding, okay. uh, calling these helplines, for example, right? So the data shows that people are accessing these services, having said that, I, I think it's not just about, uh, you know, registering responses in the long run. I think we have to think about how there can be um, other measures, uh, you know, pilots, for example, where the government is integrating responses into the health system uh, to be able to uh, identify and respond at an early stage. The kinds of, you know, changes we just, uh, kinds of programs we discussed about changing attitudes uh, towards gender equality, including mm -hmm. violence that need to be promoted, whether it's through um, TV or through schools. Um, so I think there's a range of things that, that, are, that are promising and um, are being looked into um, by different- Yes, I think there's one set of uh, measures which are just about responding. 
And then there's a longer term set of measures about why does this violence happen? Because it's unique to the pandemic. You know, it is part of normal daily life within home and outside. So clearly there's a big longer term challenge. Um, a question, we still have a couple more questions to um, then come to me. Did you want to say something, Diva? No. Yeah, I think the other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, uh, it's not just about violence, you know, in the home. There's mm. also within um, outside in public sure. spaces yeah. um, with the new sort of budgets being announced and plans for transport uh, and infrastructure. I think there's going to be a need to make ensure that there's more gender responsive design yeah. in the kinds of transport systems that are yeah. that are launched and what programs are doing, whether it's lighting, whether it's um, subsidized travel access. So things like what the Delhi government was trying. So I. I think there is going to be a need to try out a, a bunch of other um, initiatives, which I know a range of researchers, including those in the school, are are looking into and evaluating. Thank you. A couple more questions, and then we'll wrap up. So the next question comes from Amra, who is a LSE an alumni from India. Uh, for all speakers, throwing some light on the upper working class. Um, do you reckon incorporating gender sensitive policies, norms, and training? in organizations can help to sensitize individuals and impact on larger society. And from Dr. Arif Ahmed, India is big. Is there a comparative study of gender equality among states? I suspect there is. Anyway, either of you. The first one, do you think incorporating, you know, sensitive policies and so on within organizations? And since she's talking about upper working class, we're talking about the larger organizations. Can that have an impact on individuals and larger societies? I would say definitely. We need to incorporate those as, uh, you know, absolutely mandated requirements mm -hmm. within organizations for all employees. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Sure. Diva? I echo that. And I think just okay. to sort of go further and say that um, it's not just about having them on paper. So having diversity, equity, inclusion policies on paper, but actually ensuring that there is implementation, there are committees that are set up to look into these, that people are aware of their rights and benefits. Um, so I think you know being careful that it's not just something that's a rhetoric, sure. but actual implementation is uh, behind that. I think it's also of particular importance in the South Asian context because of the influence that the upper classes and upper castes have on models of behavior across society. So, you know, that whole thing of emulating uh, Sanskritization, emulating the upper caste. So, if we can't change uh, attitudes around gender in the upper echelons, it's hard to see how it's going to change in the, you know, lower down the hierarchy. Um, there was a question about a comparative study of gender equality among states. But and I think the there answer there is there's that, lots of yeah. lots there's of uh, not, we know that the north differs from the south, yeah. that there are matriarchal societies in the east, which would differ from patriarchal ones. And so uh if you just what about in the pandemic, has there been any kind of perhaps that would be interesting? Are, are different states responding uh differently on the gender equality aspect of the pandemic? I think that's an interesting question, which I don't yeah. have enough. Mm. So there's some trackers that are actually disaggregating at the subnational level. So if you look at the Global Health 5050 tracker, which looks at gender equality and COVID incidents across countries within India, they're trying to represent and collect data wherever possible at the mm. state level. But like I said, state level reporting is limited for, for many of yeah. these uh, during. I have to go to my favorite topic for, for just one minute. <laughs> That is the state that has stood out in India is Kerala. Has stood out because we talked about the self the, the self help groups and the frontline health workers, and I think Kerala with the Kudumbashri program has perhaps been able to uh, respond very much more effectively. Uh, I don't know if that is your impression, but certainly what I've read in the literature suggests that it has done rather well in the Indian context. Is that something that you have read? You could elaborate on that program a little bit, Naina, because I don't know. Just in terms of Kudumushri, it's their self-help, uh, it's a government-organized 
self-help groups, right? So we talked a lot about frontline health workers and so on. Kerala has had for a long time uh, a very organized uh, self-help groups which work quite closely with government. And they have been at the front line in responding to the pandemic. So Kerala statistics look better on the pandemic than some of the other states in India. So do you mean in terms of the health statistic or just yes, in terms of uh, infection rates and death rates? And so yeah, on average, I think Kerala has done better, but there have been periods when there were, again, the number of infections were going up. But okay. you're right, on average, it seems to have done much better than other states, particularly, for example, compared to Maharashtra, which has is, you know, has done pretty badly in terms of the number of cases that they've seen. But I think Kerala is also interesting in the sense that there were a lot of migrants coming back from yeah. the uh, West Asia. And uh, I don't know whether they, uh, how much uh, uh, data we have to understand what the economic implications of that are, because there were some anecdotal reports about these very qualified people taking up, for example, public works like Narega mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, but they might not be able to go back because jobs have dried up outside India. So I think in terms of understanding what the longer term implications of that is, particularly also for women, because uh, these women might be very much dependent on remittances coming in, um, it would be worthwhile to look into it a little bit more. Okay, we're coming to the end. I'm going to give you one second each. <laughs> what if you could if you could get the ear of your government? What is the single policy that or single intervention that you think should be given priority in making sure that the post-COVID response promotes gender equality? So one second. Really one second. <laughs> Diva, do you want to start? I'll go first. Yeah. Um I'm not saying this is something that's based on rigorous evidence, but if I were to pick one, I would certainly pick uh, expanding uh, the Integrated Child Development Scheme and the National Crash Service Scheme uh, to provide more childcare access. So to really have increased coverage of childcare. Thank you. Rosanna? If I were to pick on something, I would focus on the potential intergenerational impact of this. So I would say give school meals open up schools, start giving these in-kind transfers again, particularly when we're looking at whether it's provision of meals, whether it is free textbooks, whether it is free uniforms and focus them on the girl child. Okay, thank you very much. I think what we have, what has come out of both your um, reflections is the importance of that intergenerational and life course uh, attention that, you know, people's lives are woven together all across the life course. So for children, for, for mothers, for working women, for men. Uh, so we need quite a comprehensive approach, I think, rather than just picking on one single part of it. Um, and I think also the interdependence between work in the economy and work at home. And how does one bring that into greater alignment so that one gender is not you know, carrying the burden of uh, taking care of children and having to earn while the other is, you know, having a bit more time for themselves. Um, so I think that's been really interesting and uh, good luck with uh, persuading the government to take up your uh, priority interventions. And I just want to thank both of you very much and to thank our audience. And I'd also like to remind the audience that there will be a brief survey afterwards. Uh, following today's presentation, so take a minute to fill in the survey when you're done.